He's spoken out now for the first time about that affair with a much younger colleague, revealing he's utterly broken and ashamed, but stress he didn't groom him. The axe this but Imagine being Schofield, where you were forced to do an interview, where you had to use the phrase, I didn't groom that boy. I mean, he would have, that would have been unthinkable to him a couple of weeks back. The Axe This Morning host, who's been in hiding since the scandal broke, approached The Sun to tell his story after he says it was a week of lies flooding social media. He's admitted lying to covering up the affair, which sparked a tumultuous week with ITV bosses being accused of hiding the facts. Hiding the facts seems to be his greatest crime. Caroline Frost, the entertainment journalist, joins us on this one afternoon to you, Caroline. But, of course, he... Yes, there's, there's lies and there's a web of lies. There's a tissue of whoppers hanging around on this one. But no criminal offence that we know of, Caroline. No, and I think um, Philip Schofield is coming forward to make that very clear. Although he's sounding extremely regretful, I don't think there can be any doubt about that. He is also using his time in the public eye to say, I fully appreciate there is a massive age gap, but that happens in life. And he has also used this time to clarify when he met this young man, when he became friends with him, and then when their relationship changed. So yes, nothing illegal there at all, unless somebody comes forward with anything different. I think we can take that for now as the facts. Whether, as you say, the ick factor, the morality involved, that um, seems to be being conducted in the court of public reckoning mm. and so far no redemption for Philip Schofield. Is it, I mean it's a bit creepy isn't it I suppose, the, you know even if you give Schofield the benefit of the doubt on this one. Uh, we had this text in from Anthony who says, uh, is there any evidence that from the age of 15 or 16 all communications between them was via a parent or guardian? If not that is a red flag. Um, and that's also why did he keep drawing him nearer by a arranging a job on ITV rather than elsewhere or b giving him a job on his own program rather than another and c making him a personal assistant? I don't know if he was a personal assistant, but the other points are are fair, aren't they? Really, I mean, he did facilitate a, a visit to the studio and then ultimately work experience. Now, that's not illegal. So in any other world, some people say that's quite a nice thing to do, but it's not a mm -hmm. great look now. No, none of this passes the ick test, and that's why he's no longer in a job. I think it probably, um, I guess you could ask the question, if there's nothing wrong and there was never any intention to do anything wrong, why so many lies? The burden of secrecy is the one that he's been carrying, but he chose to carry it. So you could delve down this rabbit hole of Philip Schofield's personal morality, but I guess ultimately that's between him and his keeper. And for the rest of us, well, we've seen already, he says he'll never work in TV again. Um, I wouldn't be so sure. I mean, we've seen other people come back mm. from terrible things in the past, but he's playing a proper mayor culpa at the moment. And it seems to be working. I mean, just a Mori poll on social media and in the chat, it seems to be pretty much divided between people who are now starting to feel very sorry for him, that there are lots of people around doing worse things that have not been held to account in the way he has, and other people saying this is creepy, manipulative, a huge PR campaign for which he's great, great, been paying out a great deal of money to train him to come across as favourably as possible. So, I mean, I think you go in with your opinion of Philip Schofield. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? A very similar one. Yeah, I, I, and again, I'm, the bit that I'm really fascinated in is, you know, the, the, the whole idea of almost trial by social media. That's fascinated me for a, a, a long time. I think it was John Ronson, wasn't it, that wrote that book about exactly this, mm. the kind of witch trials, if you like, the, the, the villagers with the lit torches chasing people out based on innuendo and supposition, but no, not mm -hmm. necessarily any hard fact, all because of so th this court of Twitter and Facebook and Insta and okay. the like, which is just, it, it's yeah, utterly fascinating. It's also terrifying. Punch. It's because we don't have the stocks and we don't have the gallows anymore, yeah, but yeah. we have Twitter. It's precisely that, isn't it? And, and when I look back at people, it's funny when you just mention that, people who made their way back onto TV after they've done terrible things. I mean, Leslie Grantham, Dirty Den, killed a man, for God's sake. I think he spent 11 years in jail in Germany, was it? Caroline, you may know that better than there me. Is, and there then, is. Then I mean, you could argue that there's no point giving somebody a finite prison sentence if then you treat them as a leper forevermore, I guess. Yep. I mean, that's the whole point, isn't it? Is that you can't say it's like the footballers where 
they're allowed to come back from having served terrible sentences, but they're not allowed to actually live at that high status in society anymore. We seem to have a strange attitude. That, well, that's a good point. You know, a couple of footballers, a high-profile case of a footballer killed, uh, more than one person because of drink driving, found their way back, etc. And I think if we sat here for another half an hour, we'd probably come up with a couple of dozen people, yeah. Caroline. And then we have people who don't ever come back. We have people like Michael Barrymore. Interestingly, Philip Schofield has said that he believes there's an enormous amount of homophobia in this instance, that if it ha because it happens to be two men, that if it was a male-female thing, he believes it wouldn't be such a scandal. Possibly, um, yeah. Discuss. We we don't know. We don't have the the uh, the Pepsi test to compare, do we? At the moment. And I guess the difficulty is, if, if he came back, what in what capacity would that be? Because there would always be, uh, you know, if he's on, I don't know, any people-led show. If there's, you know, a young no. man on the show on screen, people go, ah, oh, look, Schofield's got his eye on him, etc. He's always going to have that. What you're talking about is the credibility currency that all of these brands depend on. Yeah. So they're only as useful as people rely on them and lean on them to be influenced. It's why Holly Willoughby has so many um, fashion campaigns. It's because we turn on the TV and we see this bright, wholesome, smiling figure, very attractive, very familiar. And so what she wears has a bearing on what people choose to go out and buy. And therefore, she gets her name next to a campaign. Similarly with Philip, um, different different gig, but yeah. same idea. You know, we, he's been the name of brands. He's a Princess Trust ambassador. It's all about credibility, currency, and status. And he has seen all of those things go through the floor. We're watching a brand in free fall. The fact that it happens mm. to be a human person is a separate issue, but that's what's happening. Indeed. And do you buy into this idea that his uh, co-host knew nothing about this? I, I, I'm a bit curious about this, Carolyn, well, given that my next-door neighbour, Barry, knew about it. I, I find it a bit <laughs> weird that, that Holly did Barry didn't. know? <laughs> okay. I, to I told him. That's how Barry knew. <laughs> but I so how did I know about it? But Holly well, didn't. you didn't tell Holly. So um, I should have told Holly, yes. All we, can, all we can know is that, so far... She has said she was shocked and outraged to discover all of this, that she knew as little as she is claiming to know, and that until somebody comes up with something different, um, that's all we have, and she expects to be back on the sofa um, come Monday, and yeah. uh, the ship will continue to cruise down the river. I mean, that's that's the bigger question for ITV. They've got this political questioning committee next Wednesday. They have an independent review. They're all going to be hauled into a room and asked what they knew, when they knew, what did they do about it? And she will be one of those. So um, we don't know. We don't know yeah. for her as for any of the others. Uh, we will watch with interest. Uh, they're, they're bound to, there's bound to be a lot of people flicking on at half ten or whenever that thing starts on Monday. Caroline, thank you. Uh, Caroline Frost, entertainment journalist with us here on Talk TV. That, to me, is utter... If you haven't read the book by John Ronson, called, I, is it called You Think You've Been... I'm just trying to... Th the, the name of it eludes me at the moment, but it's all about trial by social media and it, it covers a load of cases where people's lives have been absolutely turned upside down, not because they um, happen to do something illegal or anything like that, but because they were caught by social media. It was social media that caught them out. <clears throat> and that is, to a large extent... I mean, there are other issues around this, but to a large extent, that is kind of what's happening here. Um, and the Ronson book delves into all of that, and it does it brilliantly and j just highlights many examples around the world where people's lives have been uh, just completely stopped. Be livelihoods utterly removed. Your ability to earn money and feed your family gone because of a piling on social media. Actually, this is like a... Look, I know it's been around for a long time. Old Twitter, it's over a decade old, and Facebook even longer and stuff. And you know, it's not new this stuff, but only perhaps more recently we are really beginning to see the sort of bilious nature of as, as to what social media can do. And I think with the Schofield thing, what it what it can do, most sensible people will go, well, anyone that writes these horrible litigious comments that clearly are way exaggerated and invented forms of the, the facts around Schofield. We just ignore them. But it sows a bit of a seed. So if you're an advertiser, 
uh, you're looking for somebody to head up your sponsorship, you're probably not going to go to Schofield, not because he's broken any great law of the land. In fact, he's broken none at all. But there is a sort of a whiff and a perception. And the whiff and the perception, it may well be that he was the initial architect of it, but that has been fueled and fanned by social media. So social media did, well, you know, for those people who like hate this bloke and absolutely believe that he's some horrendous sex offender based on nothing more than the desire to want to think it, those people have got their powder flesh. You've got your scalp. Exactly what happened. He's not going to starve. Schofield's worth a few quid. But that's hardly the point. I think he would exchange all of that for his credibility to, to return. And perhaps some sort of career. He's, he's prepared to think, I, I can never work again. And when you consider it now, because there's a, you, can't, you can't undo what we all have heard, the innuendo and everything else. That can't be put back in the box. It's out there now. So what could you even get him to do if he returned to television? If he returned to a format, what would that even look like?